Why should the richest landowner, the Duke of Buclo, who inherited 277,000 acres of land, receive subsidy of over a million pounds a year? It's completely ridiculous. Don't talk to me about lack of affordability when you're doing things like that. Bullshit, to coin a phrase. On this episode, I spoke with Professor Guy Standing on the topic of universal basic income. Guy is an economist, author of several books, and co-founder of the Basic Income Earth Network. Please note this episode was recorded remotely via Zoom, so there are a few audio glitches. So I will have um, given you a proper introduction at the start of the show, but just for anyone who might not be aware of you and your work, how would you describe your career as it relates to UBI and uh, what, if anything, you've focused on at the moment? I've been working uh, as an economist. I got a PhD from University of Cambridge. And then I went and worked in the International Labour Organization. And I became aware that the neoliberal experiments being launched by Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, and guided by the Monk Pellerin Society of right-wing economists from around the world, was fundamentally transforming the economic system into one where they were pursuing flexible labor markets, increasing the power of capital, and it was bound to increase insecurity and inequality. And at that time, the social security systems developed in the post-war era under the guidance of William Beveridge's report of 1942 and Bismarck's earlier uh, attempts to create a welfare system. It was quite clear to me that that was breaking down and wouldn't work in the new type of economic system that was emerging. And... A group of us formed Bien, which at the time was the name I came up with because it meant good and well in French, was Basic Income Earth Network, basically to explore how we could uh, introduce a basic income to give people income security and to do research and look at various discussions of basic income historically and so on. And and since then, we have been working extensively around the world. And I've been working on it, I've written a number of books and done pilots in different parts of the world. And uh, clearly with the pandemic, it's become a, a very topical issue. Every single day I get requests for, for interviews and Zoom speeches, conferences, and so on. Um, so it's been a long journey. And I think it's reached the stage where we have a 50% chance of it being introduced in some major countries during this pandemic. And if it is introduced in two or three countries, I think it will be a domino effect very quickly. It will become the new part of a progressive agenda. So it's been a very interesting journey and I hope it's not over yet. And I feel elated and disappointed by what's happening in the context of this pandemic, but we'll come back to that later. It's a journey where I've worked with literally hundreds and hundreds of people around the world. We've got networks in 35 countries and my books have been translated into 24 languages. So it's been a journey where I've been able to interact with enormous number of fantastic people and to go out and be able to launch pilots where you are providing thousands of people with basic income and then monitoring and evaluating the impact is something that is um, humbling, and at the same time, 
a matter of pride because you very few people get the opportunity to put into practice what they believe. Mm. And to see the results, we come back to that later perhaps, has been one of the, the joys of the work I've been doing. So when you look around, what are the actual wrongs that you see that UBI is attempting to right? Well, I've always argued that basic income, which for the listeners I should define, is something the way you would say that everybody has a right to subsistence, a right to live, a right to live in dignity. And it goes back, in my way of thinking, to the foundational documents of the British Constitution and the Constitution of all democracies. Donald Trump is, doesn't know about these things, but most of us who value democracy believe in the Magna Carta and the Charter of the Forest which was sealed, both were sealed, and came into law in 1217. And they were sealed in Westminster. And the Charter of the Forest was the longest piece of legislation, the longest lasting piece of legislation in British history. It was only repealed by a Conservative government in 1971. It's a remarkable achievement. And then that document said that every free man has a right to subsistence in the commons. And for me, a basic income stems from that, that principle, which is that it's a matter of common justice. And if you think of private wealth and public wealth, all governments allow the inheritance of private wealth. If that's the case, it is something for nothing. The people who are inheriting that money or property or whatever haven't done anything to deserve it, right? But if you allow private inheritance, why not allow the fact that public wealth we enjoy is due to the efforts of many, many generations before us? Much more than anything we do ourselves. Our standard of living is due to the efforts of millions of people before us. But we don't know whose ancestors did more or less. We can't possibly judge. And therefore, I think it's a matter of common justice that everybody receives a social dividend on the public wealth, a modest right to subsistence. And I think that that stems from a belief in the commons, a belief that our society rests on natural environmental gifts from nature, or if you're religious, God, or whatever. And we all have an equal right to that, and yet they've been taken away from us by various illegitimate means over history. I documented that in my book, Plunder of the Commons. And in a sense, we should realize that everybody, every commoner, I'm a commoner, you're a commoner, everybody listening is a I commoner. I definitely am. Definitely. And we, as commoners, are entitled to an equal compensation for the fact that the commons have been taken away from us, the natural commons, the social commons, the civil commons, the cultural commons, the intellectual commons that have been taken away and converted into private property, merely through illegitimate laws, in my view. So we, we, we really have an ethical justification, it's a matter of justice. But in addition, the second ethical justification is that we all say we believe in freedom. Basic income wouldn't give us total freedom, it wouldn't be a panacea in any way, but it would enhance freedom. It would enhance what's sometimes called libertarian freedom, the freedom to choose, the freedom to make choices, the freedom to say no to an oppressive relationship 
be able to walk out of abusive relationship and to say no to an exploitative employer or landlord, it would in strengthen that. So if I can just jump in here, why do you favour essentially redistributing this money through UBI rather than a more typical approach such as taxes and higher minimum wages well, me, and things like that? Let me come back to that, Chris, because I want to I want to emphasise this freedom. The last part of the freedom is this. Freedom is sometimes called Republican freedom. The freedom to look other people in the eyes and feel as equals and not bend to their will. That's very important. And the third ethical reason for basic income is that it gives people basic security. And that's a human need. And therefore, we need it. Um, I think that the question you just asked is, is not the same thing as a basic income. The the use of taxation for democratically desirable aims favors some groups more than others. It will favor certain interests relative to others. But when we talk about a basic income, we're talking about giving everybody an equal economic right in the state. It strengthens and reinforces a sense of citizenship. It is a mechanism for showing solidarity and giving people those things that I've just been talking about. Whereas a taxation system and spending on this and that and the other, uh, all are necessary, but they're not the same thing. Right. Okay. So in doing some research for this, I saw um, your TED talk and uh, I read various articles that you've written. And one thing that you mentioned is the precariat, which is a term that I wasn't familiar with. Um, assuming that some of the listeners also aren't familiar with that term, would you mind just briefly explaining what that means and who the precariat are? Yeah, I've been working on the growth of the precariat for uh, more than 20 years. And after the economic shock, I wrote a book called The Precariat, The New Dangerous Class. And that book has gone viral. It's been translated, as I said, to, into 24 languages. And I've given hundreds of talks all over the world, more than 500 in 40 countries. And I, every single day since the book was published in 2011, I receive emails from people around the world saying, this book is about me. I'm part of the precariat. And what the, the analysis has done is say, look, globalization and the neoliberal economic system has produced rentier capitalism, where more and more of the income is going to the owners of property, and a new global class structure has taken shape. And it, the top is a plutocracy, billionaires and people making vast wealth, whether the economy is in downturn or upturn or whatever, but they still make more wealth. Then you have an elite, then the old salariat, the people who have employment security, career uh, jobs in corporations or in government agencies, looking forward to a pension and having paid holidays and all of the trappings of salaried employment, which is shrinking. And then underneath that is the old proletariat, the industrial working class, who were being habituated all the time to accepting an eight to five or a nine to six or whatever it might be, our stable, boring job. And they were paid wages and increasingly non-wage benefits. That's shrinking as well everywhere. And more and more of those are being tipped into this precariat. I define the precariat in three dimensions. First is that people are being expected to live a life of unstable labor, uh, insecure labor. I don't call it precarious work. I don't like that term. But they, they don't expect their jobs to lead anywhere. They expect that they will be living bits and pieces lives without an occupational trajectory where you're developing yourself through your work and labor. 
Second, they have to rely very much on money wages and live in a life of uncertainty where they're exploited off workplaces outside labor time as much as inside workplaces and during labor time and often most importantly by debt private debt mechanisms so everybody who's in the precariat around the world feel and are on the edge of unsustainable debt and that defines their insecurity and their uncertainty and and the third dimension is they feel they I like the term denizens. They feel like denizens, not citizens. In other words, they don't feel they have the rights of a full citizen. And this doesn't apply just to migrants. It applies to many, many, many people now who feel that they don't have social rights. They don't have economic rights. They don't have cultural or civil rights. They don't have equality before the law. And they don't have the capacity to be anything other than a supplicant. For me, the most important single thing about being in the precariat is you feel like a supplicant. You feel as if you have to rely on the discretion of bureaucrats, of parents, of employers, of landlords, or whoever it might be. You don't have rights. And the precariat is growing. But what I said in the book, the 2011 book, and there's a subsequent sequel, is, I said on page one, that unless the insecurities and aspirations of the precariat are understood, there will be the emergence of a political monster battling about fascism and populism. And you will not be surprised that in November 2016, I received a lot of emails from around the world saying your monster has arrived. Well, as we're talking at this moment on November the 6th, I trust most of your listeners will be joining me in hoping that that monster is about to be kicked out of the White House. But it's only a temporary reprieve because the atavistic part of the precariat, the part that doesn't have a lot of education and they feel they've lost yesterday are still going to be supporting neo-fascist populists in the near future because our political elites, our parties have not yet come to grips with the two dimensions of the precariat, the insecurities, and the aspirations, because I believe that the precariat is not just a bunch of victims. Yes, they have insecurities. Yes, they have the characteristics that I've been describing, but they don't want, in the majority, they don't want to go back to yesterday. They want a different type of society, a different type of living, a different way of living in which we develop ourselves through our work, not our labor, we develop ourselves with interactions with nature, with care, with a different lifestyle. And those aspirations are ecologically well-grounded and they're socially well-grounded. But at the moment, our politicians just don't seem to get it. I worked as an economic advisor to John McDonnell uh, the last three years and John did get it, but he couldn't articulate it because he was having to be worried constantly by the atavistic part of labor, wanting yesterday back. One come back and their agenda is reactionary in a double sense, reacting to events and reactionary is trying to put back something that we shouldn't want to put back. What's so pleasurable about being in a boring job for 30 years and looking forward to something equivalent to a golden watch at the end of it. That's not a, a life worth aspiring to hold. And I think the educated part of the precariat today are looking for a, a politics of paradise. That's what I called it in the books. And for me, the precariat is the most important way of looking at this debate 
about basic income because fundamentally the income distribution system of the 20th century, the last century, has broken down. It's broken down. It won't come back. We will not get higher and higher wages again because we're in a global system. And until the wages in India and China have risen to something close to British levels, British wages will not rise. And it's a fool's errand if you claim that wages are the answer. They won't. If any effort was to be successful in pushing up wages, and they've been going stagnant and going down for 30 years, if there was some improvement, then more automation would take place, more jobs would be outsourced to Southeast Asia, more investment would go there, and that would make the situation just as bad. So for me, you need a new income distribution system, and that, that is the context. And I found that talking about the precariat and basic income is now understood by huge numbers of people, and they don't have to be economists, they get it. And it's a matter of converting the old style social democrat type politics into something different and give them strong spines to go for a, a more visionary part of politics that we need. And at the moment, the so-called left is not offering it. I find the thing that makes me furious and sad today as we're talking is that fact, the fact is that over 69 million Americans have just voted for a man who is clearly mad, clearly evil, clearly a total liar, and yet 69 million people have voted for the bastard. I'm sorry if that offends any listener. But to me, it's something that relates to the fact that our politics on the left have not been utopian enough. They've not been visionary. They've not been about inventing a new future, a new renaissance. And that, I think, is, is really linked to the whole debate about basic income. We'll be right back after these ads, unless there aren't any. So I'm fairly convinced by this, having listened to some of the things that you have to say and also listening to other people like um, Andrew Yang is probably the, uh, the yeah. biggest proponent or most well-known proponent at the moment. Ten we years converted down the road. Him. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and he, yeah, he's been working with some of our, our colleagues in the US and he did a great job, incidentally, uh, much better than anybody thought he would. They all thought he would be wiped out. We did too, actually, right at the beginning. We thought, well, well yeah. done. But, but actually, he's done fantastically and he's really helped put it on the map in the US. And had the timing of COVID been different, he probably would have done uh, even better because... A lot of people now seem to see the value of UBI since so many people now are out of work, even if it's just temporary. Uh, one of the main funders of uh, Andrew Yang's campaign uh, told me the other day that he, he's, he's a bit angry with Andrew because he withdrew from the campaign uh, just before his messages would have been totally uh, topical with yeah. the pandemic. And uh, if, had he stayed in, he would have had the key message, which we've been trying to get across, across the world uh, since uh, February and March, that a basic income is an economic imperative in a pandemic slump. Yeah, we could have been maybe even looking at a Vice President Yang if things had been yeah, <laughs> timed differently, but maybe next time. Yep. As I was saying, I'm largely convinced, but... Um, obviously, the big question that most people are going to have is, how is this going to be paid for? Well, in my in my books, I explain that uh, there are several ways of funding a basic income. First of all, I want to make it absolutely plain that it is eminently affordable. It isn't anybody who says it's unaffordable is ignorant or prejudiced. Well, sorry to interrupt. Get, just to give that some context, how much would you actually expect a UBI payment to be? Let's say if you're in a 
country such as the UK or the US because that will obviously affect the affordability? I, I, I never give a straight answer to this question for the following reason. I think that any amount is going to be better than none. And that I would like an amount to be equal to the subsistence level of poverty so that it gets everybody enough income to get out of poverty. But I think initially one has to be realistic. As you build up the funding capacities, the level has to be rising because you're going to have to substitute for other schemes and that takes time as you fold it into to reality. And I think we, we've done pilots in Africa and India and Canada and various other places where we provided a, a basic income that's, that's equivalent to half the poverty level but it's had a huge positive effect because it, it, it comes unconditionally, it comes a guaranteed, it's not taken away as your earned income goes up, you still have it. And it, it uh, for a person who's in poverty uh, to get 50 pounds a week as a basic income is something substantial. Mm-hmm. I was looking at figures that, you know, one people who are in private rented accommodation in Britain today, and I've sum, summarized the evidence in my book, Battling Eight Giants, my new book, and I've summarized it and I said, well, once you've paid for your food and the rent for your apartment, huge number of people have on average only £23 a week for all other expenditures. If so, suddenly you were to get a 50 pounds basic income, which I'm not proposing incidentally, I'm just saying, supposing it was that amount, then for those people, that's a big help. And I think that the idea of a basic income is that you've got to build up, and I'm proposing a, a sovereign wealth fund approach where you build up a fund, where you take levies, from uh, the incursions into our commons, and you build it up in, into the form that the Norwegians have done with their oil proceeds. We should have done the same in Britain. And you, as you build it up and you invest, the money and the dividends get larger and larger, and the dividends are handed out to everybody as a basic income. Uh, in principle, if they did that in Norway, every Norwegian is a, is a millionaire now from paying out the dividends. And Alaska has introduced one in 1976 and it, until it was mucked up by a Republican governor recently, it was providing everybody with an amount, two or three thousand dollars a year, and it was building and people appreciated it. So the levels levels will, will vary. But what I'm advocating now, and I have done since the pandemic struck, is that the government should have given everybody a guaranteed emergency basic income for the duration of the pandemic. Instead, they've spent billions and billions of pounds on the furlough scheme, which has not reached the precariat, which has keep kept people in phony jobs that don't actually exist anymore or allowed incredible amount of fraud where people are being paid, but in actual fact, they're, they're actually doing labor and being paid by their employers off the books. And it's, it's been regressive. In other words, it's increasing inequality because it's giving far more to a high income earner who's earning on, say on 2,500 pounds a month, gives five times as much as anybody in the precariat is getting under the scheme. It's ridiculous, but it's billions of pounds. And if you use the billions of pounds, plus the money that has been given as interest-free loans to major corporations, you could have paid everybody a decent uh, basic income. But at the moment, I'm arguing that, in fact, governments can afford to have budget deficits. So they can afford to pay and use money through the central bank, the Bank of England or whatever, to give an emergency basic income. And why you need to do that is this. The resilience of all of us 
the resilience of British society will depend on the resilience of the weakest members of our society. And as long as they are being left in insecurity, this pandemic and the slump around it will rumble on. We'll have a second and a third wave and so on. And the economic consequences in the long term will be far worse than if you'd given everybody a basic income and said, then look after the jobs so that the jobs that are still desired and economic would continue and other people would start looking for different types of work and labor, but at least everybody would have basic security. And that would have helped stimulate demand. This is a demand shock. I'm an economist. A demand shock means that there's been a huge hit on aggregate demand for basic goods and services. If that happens, then lack of investment, lack of jobs, the cycle continues, and we need to stimulate basic demand for basic goods and services in the local communities up and down the land. And that would be done if you had everybody having a basic income, even though everybody would have been suffering equally. This, this current, current situation, the precariat are suffering far, far, far more than the salariat or the elite or the plutocrats whose incomes and wealth have gone up hugely during this pandemic. So for me, it's, it's looking at it from an affordability point of view. The first you have to say an emergency basic income, budget deficits, using monetary policy, we can do it. But in the longer term, you need to build up a capital fund, a commons fund, as I call it. And I've shown how you can do that in my book, Plunder of the Commons. And just think, for example, Chris, we need a carbon tax. We need big carbon taxes because global warming and fossil fuel greenhouse gas emissions are going up and up. And if that continues, we will have more pandemics, more threats of extinction. And we need carbon taxes. But the problem with carbon taxes is that they are regressive. In other words, for a poor person, they come to a higher percentage of their income than for a rich person. And therefore, by themselves, are politically hard to sell. If you say the revenue from a carbon tax will go into this fund and be used to pay out basic income for everybody, then in fact it will not increase inequality, it will reduce inequality and will be popular, as they're finding in British Columbia, for example, doing the same thing as I'm talking to you from Switzerland, the same thing they've been doing here. And it's very popular. So for me, it's you've got to think out of the box, think transformatively, realistically, then I'm going to come to another statistic. According to the Treasury itself, the government's own figures, which I've got and I've summarized, every year the government pays out in subsidies and tax reliefs the amount of 430 billion pounds. Mostly it goes to rich people, rich corporations, and they get the benefits. You and I don't get the benefits. But that 430 billion pounds is not contributing to economic performance. It is a gift for nothing. It's a gift to the wealthy. Why should the richest landowner, the Duke of Buclos, who has 277,000 acres of land, receive subsidy of over a million pounds a year? It's ridiculous. It's completely ridiculous. Don't talk to me about lack of affordability when you're doing things like that, because that money, cumulative amount, could pay a huge basic income to people. I'm not saying that will be taking place overnight, but when that sort of thing is happening, don't tell me it's unaffordable. Bullshit. Coin a phrase. So that definitely seems like the biggest hurdle that you need to get over. But as you've been going around spreading this message, what are the most common objections to UBI that you've come across? Well, that is the that is the objection made. And a lot of people who are not economists but sort of support basic income find that they have difficulty answering that criticism from 
from people um, and, and wish they had the information to be able to answer it. I, in my book, Basic Income and How We Can Make It Happen, there's a whole chapter on what I've identified over the years as the 17 objections that have been made to basic income. I hope that I've given coherent, intelligible answers to all of those. I think the second most uh, common objection, which stems from a deep moralistic prejudice is that if people had a basic income, they wouldn't work. I think that's an insult to the human condition. And all opinion polls, when they ask people, if you had a basic income, would you stop working? They say, no, of course not. Of course not. I want to improve my life, but maybe some other people, but not me. And, and that is, that corresponds to the findings of our pilots and pilots have been conducted in many places now. And I want to make the following point very, very forcefully. The evidence is overwhelming that a basic income results in an increase in work and more productive work, more collaborative work and better types of work. And it doesn't reduce work at all. It's a prejudice, mainly peddled by people who've always had basic security themselves. And one wonders why they haven't stopped working. Oh, we're different from them. But that's not the case. People all over the world want to improve their life and the life of their children and their loved ones. And wherever they start, they want to improve it. And I think that it's an insult for middle-class people to waffle on about, it will lead to reduced work. But then I want to say to the old proletariat types who tend to go along with that, for something for nothing. Why should they have something for nothing? We all need to feel interdependent. We all need to strengthen a sense of social solidarity. And as long as millions of people are insecure, we will not get that sense of social solidarity. And a basic income is not a panacea, but it would least give people a sense of better control, more dignity. And I think that's, that's the answer to that objection. There are other practical types, like it will be inflationary. No, it won't, because you're talking about shifting expenditure and getting a more balanced uh, economy, a more balanced society. One of the things I often say is that a basic income would encourage us to do more forms of unpaid work that we're learning to appreciate in this pandemic are some of the most valuable forms of work of all. Suddenly, people who are caring for other people are doing essential work. But in our statistics, in our textbooks, and in our sense of political rhetoric, we don't treat that as work. We should be treating that as work. It's an insult to women in particular that care work. If a woman cares for a child or an elderly relative as an unpaid form of activity, it's called non-work. If she works caring for somebody else's mother or child and she's paid, it's called work. And we should demand reform of our, our economic statistics. I was talking to Ed Miliband recently about this and he, I said, you should be putting this issue because it doesn't sound sexy, but it's very, very important because it's the way we see life. And this pandemic is teaching us, I hope, that many forms of unpaid activity are the most essential for a good society. So while I was doing some research, I found a comment on a YouTube video, which isn't one of your videos, but I just wanted to read this to you. All in caps, obviously. Um, it said, socialism doesn't work. How many people have to die before you realize that? I just wondered if you'd like to comment on that point of view. Well, I think it's just pathetic. 
um, <laughs> like a Trumpism. I mean, we're not we're not talking about capitalism or socialism when we're talking about giving people basic security. And it's not about death. Death comes in many forms. Many people are dying from stress, anxiety, morbidity, heart attacks, suicidal tendencies, because they are insecure, because they are in the lower echelons of the precariat. We know that. I mean, I've been approached by people who feel they're part of the precariat, they've read my book or whatever, and they write and say, I feel like just ending it, just ending it. And they feel like that because they're chronically insecure. They find they have to be applying for bloody universal credit or whatever it might be. And then they get sanctioned and they get insulted and, and the indignities of having to survive. And no wonder many people feel suicidal. No wonder that it induces diabetes and cardiac problems and all sorts of other medical conditions and mental illnesses. All of us would be like that. All of us, don't kid yourself. Any of us shouldn't kid ourselves. And therefore we need to think with more empathy, more compassion about other people. Try to put yourself in other people's shoes, if they've got shoes, and think how they would be feeling in those circumstances. And you and I would feel exactly the same, possibly worse because we may not be prepared for it, but we must have a better vision of society. It is a scandal that Britain, still the fifth or whatever, sixth richest country in the world, has millions of people resorting to food banks or are sleeping out or fear sleeping out in the cold. It's unacceptable. And yet the politicians are just waffling on and are taking a utilitarian approach. As long as 40% of the electorate support them, never mind about the bottom 30% that might be having problems. As long as my 40% supports us. Um, we're coming up towards the end of the end of the time now. I'd like to try and end on a high note, though, so I hope this doesn't backfire. But when you think about the near or possibly not so near future, how optimistic are you with regards to UBI or more generally? Do you have a, a typically optimistic view of the future? I think this pandemic is presenting us with a pivotal moment historically. I call it the global transformation. It could go authoritarian, populist, and undemocratic and entrenching elites and the finances and so on, or it could lead to a sudden flourishing of progressive thinking, progressive energies, anger at the existing structures, and a sense that we must collectively move to a new politics and stop fiddling and stop compromising and I think there's a sense of optimism out there. I feel that there's genuinely a 50% chance now of a new transformation, a new progressive agenda. And I think the young and the precariat are beginning to mobilize, are beginning to organize, are beginning to articulate a new vocabulary, a new ecological based sense of existence. And I think that is good. There, there are sound reasons for some sense of optimism. That's why I support the Extinction Rebellion. I support basic income movements that are flourishing now. And the, the, the things are coming together. So in a sense, I'm, I'm moderately optimistic. As long as we can escape from the threat of neo-fascism, and shame those who call themselves progressives for not doing enough, I, I think there's a good chance now. But it does require all of us, all of us out of all ages, to be energetic, 
There is no excuse for passivity. There is no excuse for sitting back and saying, oh, we can't do anything. We can. But only if we participate and concentrate our energies into activities, collective activities that are going to strengthen this, this political, economic and ecological journey that we must be taking. Okay, well, on that note, um, where can people go to find out more about your work? Well, on my webpage and also my books, um, they're, they're, they're freely they're available, they're in paperback, they're low cost. Um, for people who are interested, it the, the, depends if you're British, but my basic income book is, is a Pelican book. My Battling Eight Giants is a paperback, which is, which is um, low cost. The plunder of the commons at the moment, I, I wish I could spend more time on it because the loss of the commons is something that is really, really sad aspect of politics in Britain for the last 20 years or so. And, and I think that it's documented there just how much we must do to recover our commons. Guy, thank you so much for being on the show. Great. Good luck with the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of A Brighter Tomorrow. As this is a new show, we don't have a regular release schedule, so I strongly suggest you subscribe on your favourite podcasting platform. You can also follow us on Twitter at BrighterPod or join the conversation on Reddit at r slash BrighterTomorrowPod. Also, if you enjoyed the show, please consider leaving a review as it really helps us to climb the charts and reach more people. Finally, you can email us at BrighterTomorrowPod at gmail.com if you want to say hello. Thanks again and see you next time.